Well, amen. Tonight I'm going to be preaching from the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. And I'm going to be again reading with verse 1, reading down through verse 7. It says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elijah said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you, your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside all the full ones. So she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, you and your sons, and live on the rest. Can we pray? Father, I just thank you tonight for your word and for the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that as this word goes forth, that, Father, whoever is listening would just sense the confirming sense of the Holy Spirit, making your word alive to each and every one, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, this is just such a surreal time with all the things going on in the world. For me, the big part is I'm not going to church like I used to go to church in a normal way. Of course, I'm here and sharing church with you, but I've just always loved the gathering together of the saints. Even at Mount Zion when we have multiple services on Sunday morning, I enjoy being in church. I enjoy the worship and praise. I enjoy the presence of the Lord, so this is a different time. Uh, my family has experienced loss this week, and so there's all kinds of things been going on, but at the same time, I sense God saying this is a time for his people to begin to break forth into a new dimension and to a new level of faith. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And I'm a person that's been walking the walk of faith since we started in our ministry. And so today I want to share a message with you that will inspire faith, but also gives us some understanding how to walk in faith at the same time, recognizing that when you're walking the walk of faith, things that may not be going exactly how you would expect, but as you continue to walk in obedience with God, you're going to see the fulfillment of everything that God has spoken that he was going to do. I want to start with verse 1 here. It says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Now, this verse here is talking about what I'd call unexpected suffering. This woman's husband was a part of the ministry. He was one of the sons of the prophets. Elijah was a well-known prophet, so he had what some called the school of the prophets, a gathering together people, like-minded, like-calling, who sought the Lord and heard the voice of God for the children of Israel. The old covenant was called the law and also the prophets. They had the law so that you would know what guidelines God expected them to live by, but then they had the prophets so there could be that ever-present reality of the word of God. Now, that's true in the New Covenant as well. We have the Scriptures. We believe in the Bible. We believe in the Word of the Lord. But we also believe there should be an inspiration that comes to us by the help of the Holy Spirit. And that's what preaching is all about. It's that word that's spoken that inspires faith in the hearts and the minds of the people. The Bible says, how shall they believe unless there is a preacher? So faith comes by hearing that word inside of your heart and your spirit. Now, I think at this po point of the verse I just read to you, this woman's just in a panic. She's so disappointed and thinking like, why is it here I am, the wife of a man who has served God, now he's dead and our creditors have come and now they want to make our sons into their slaves. 
Most of us are familiar with slavery in history, but it's important for us to understand there were different kinds of slavery. Sometimes there was slavery where you'd just go to a, another country and through war take prisoners perhaps or just find people and take them to another country and make them into slaves. But there was also a, an economic way this would happen where if you owed money, they would not only be able to have control of your possessions, literally they could take possession of a person. And that's the situation that this woman found herself in. Now I have uh, so much in my heart and, and such a desire that we would begin to understand in this day we're living in dire times. There is, of course, the virus that's being a plague upon the nations. But because of that, because of the shutdowns and all these things, we have economic distress and we're getting all kinds of reports. Man, it's going to be bad. So, of course, the government's stepping in to try to help. And uh, it's a good thing to have some help now and then. But you have to understand that in the end, it needs to be about faith. I don't know about you, but when I find out my government's going trillions and trillions of dollars more into debt, it makes me think, well, that money's not going to last forever. And so what happens? Something else come along. I'm not saying this to make you afraid. I'm just saying the just shall live by faith. And so we need to be a people that say, okay, Lord, these are unexpected situations. We don't know what to do. We might be like a mother who's in great distress for her children, but we have to have confidence to believe that in the midst of our situation, you're going to be able to do something about it. Now, this particular woman didn't go to the Lord herself. She was so used to the man of God that she went right to him and told him the situation and wanted some answers on what she could do about it. Look what this next verse is said. Scripture says, and I'm going to read here from Luke chapter 13. It says, are those 18 on whom the tower in Shalom fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, why am I sharing this scripture? Well, because I want you to understand something about that woman, which is so much a part of our human condition. She was in distress because of her situation, but she was also in a quandary about, well, how could this be happening? My husband was a man of God. He was a prophet. He was somebody who was doing what he was supposed to do. And, and, and that's what I call unexpected suffering. And sometimes the suffering that can be such a turmoil for us because when things happen, the first thing that we are going to ask ourselves is, do I deserve this? What have I done wrong? What has my husband done wrong? If my husband was doing what he was supposed to be doing, he was serving the Lord, how could this have possibly come upon me? And they questioned Jesus the same uh, about different circumstances and situation. And the scripture I just read to you was one of those kind of a situation. They were asking a question about, well, does this person deserve to have this happen to him? What have they done wrong? And Jesus tells the story about the Tower of Shalom. It was a tower that fell, and when it fell, Jesus asked the question, well, do you think it just hurt people that had done wrong and deserved this to happen? No, you need to understand, just like he said, I'm telling you, no, that's not true. When the Tower of Shalom fell, it fell on people who deserved it, and certainly people we would say don't deserve it. That's why it's so important for us to understand how we need to be mindful of our circumstances and situation, and be very careful that when we're walking in the dimension of faith that we would understand how important it is for us not to allow ourselves to be caught up in fear not to begin to question ourselves and maybe you think well maybe this should be happening to me or or letting some type of a condemnation come upon us and you know the same thing is true as we're as Christians in this world in which we live we have to be so careful not to say well this is God's judgment upon our nation and this is this and this is that now I can tell you this much God God is moving right now. I've even shared how the winds of heaven are blowing. I've used the analogy of Revelation chapter 6 about the four horsemen of the revelation. But I also understand that God wants us to be mindful, not of the problem, but of the solution. And what is it that God is speaking to us? And this message is for all believers here today. We need to understand how important it is that we put our trust in the Lord and not allow doubt to come into our hearts and think perhaps we deserve this thing. I've always said this growing up in church. I've often heard over the years growing 
growing up in church, people saying, well, because of the sin, God's judgment's coming on our nation. Well, one of the problems with that is I'm in my nation, and I recognize what Jesus said to the church. You need to be salt and light. Light is you have something in your life that people can see and say, I want that. They have something I have need of. Church, the world needs our light. Darkness is covering the earth and even gross darkness the people. But what do we need to do? We need to arise and shine so the glory of the Lord can be seen upon us. And when we talk about being salt, that means we're preserving what's going on in the world. So I'm not saying, Lord, judge America. I'm saying, Lord, let me be such a light and such an influence that you look at the United States of America or whatever nation we're talking about and say, well, because my people are there and because they're doing what they're supposed to do, I'm going to be generous and merciful to this nation. Now, there's another aspect of this I want to talk about, and I'm going to read another scripture from the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. It says, Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? In this scripture, Jesus is talking about the principles of the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these other things shall be added up. Upon you. You see, when you put God in the perspective of your life as your priority, you know what God says? Well, they're taking care of my kingdom. I'm going to take care of their world. And that's why he says, you need to understand that, well, if a bird falls from the heavens, God knows about it. He knows everything about our lives. That's why I've always loved to share with people that since I was a little kid, my desire and greatest testimony concerning God is not how big and awesome he is. Of course, I reverence that and appreciate that. What amazed me is how, well, this little boy by the name of Lauren Corvubius, who was shy, introverted, and lived in a very small world, little anxious about the world he lived in, that one day God became small enough to come into my life. And I want you to know today, wherever you at, whatever's going on in your life, that God says, I'm aware of you. I know who you are. I know your circumstances. I know your situation. I don't want you to fall under condemnation. I don't want you to feel like, what have I done wrong here? What your Savior is saying to you is, open up your heart to me. Just put me first. Show your priority is correct. And when you seek first my kingdom, says the mighty God, you're going to see that I'm going to be able to bless you. And that's what this woman had to realize. She had to realize that maybe something bad happened. Maybe it looks like the worst thing is going to happen. But God is able to do something when we put our trust completely in him. Now, having said that, let's go back to the story. It says, then he said, Go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels do not gather, just a few. Now, having said that, I want to share a story that I've often shared here at Mount Zion. And, and I want to go a little bit more into the detail of the story so you can learn something about the walk of faith. When we were first looking for a building, we were just a small group of people. We had it so much in our heart that we would start a church because we were teaching people. Uh, my mom especially had started a Bible class in her home and she had heard a word from God. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and she always had such a love for the word of God and she wanted people to understand what the word of God was all about. And She had taught me from a little child about the scriptures and she instilled within me a heart and a love for the word of God. That's why I appreciate my mom and what impact she had on my life because she taught me how to reverence the power of the word of God and what a difference that would make. And so when we were learning about new truths, we wanted to start a church so that we could have a place where people could come and they could find out about the word of God. Now, we were just a very small group of people at the time, and we were not a group of people with some money. Now, see, this all started with my mom having a ladies' prayer group, and the ladies that were gathered together were ladies 
ladies whose husbands were not Christians. In some cases, they were single mothers. There wasn't too many people with jobs there. And so when we knew God told us to start a church and we were out looking for a building, we were thinking about all of our finances that we had put together, which was not very much money. We went and looked at a building on Clintonville Road out here in the Clarkston area where we are presently worshiping the Lord. And when we went there, we saw a beautiful building. It was relatively new. The congregation had pretty well uh, disassembled because of a church split. And so this building was for sale because they wanted to perhaps go to a new location, get a fresh start. Looked at this building, we're like, wow, wouldn't it be neat if we could afford a building like that? And uh, so we just told the realtor, well, this isn't exactly what we were looking for. Well, as I was praying and saying, Lord, you just have to guide us and let us know what building we're supposed to find. He said, Lauren, if you'll go the way of spirit, you'll possess things others have not possessed before. And that's what happens when the word of the Lord comes to you. I heard that word, but I knew a lot more than just what he said to me. I knew he was saying, Lauren, that church that you saw that you think you can't afford, that building that seems so out of reach, that's the building I want you to go after. And so that's exactly what we set ourselves to do. I told everybody, well, this is the building God wants us to have. And so we decided we're going to go get that building. Now, we couldn't afford the building. And so we told them, well, we'd like to have this building. And they said, well, we want cash. You need to go to a bank. Well, we were just starting as a church. Obviously, a bank is going to just laugh at us. But we thought, well, if this is what they're telling us to do, that's what we did. They didn't laugh at us. They were very generous and nice. They just said, well, when you got three years of financial records, come back and we'll be glad to give you a mortgage. And so our salesman said, well, tell them you'll do it on a land contract. And so I said, oh, okay, how much is that? And he said, well, you'd need to have at least 40000 40, down is what the first number was. And so I was like, wow, that's great. We'll do that. Go ahead, tell them. And, uh, of course, they came back a little later and said, yeah, we'll take it. Land contract, but you need to have 45000 down. Now, our realtor was not a part of what we were doing. He wasn't part of the ministry. He had no idea that we were living by faith. And I'm like, I don't have 40000 40, What's 5000 more? So I just said, sure, we'll do it. And so we made an agreement that we were going to purchase it on a land contract with 45000 down. Now, we did everything that we possibly could in order to raise money. We were having garage sales, bake sales. People were putting in what they had. And, well, the money was coming in, but not nearly enough. My dad said, well, I have uh, money in CD. If you want to just pay me the interest, I'll let, loan you $10,000. Might as well use it for the kingdom. I'm like, oh, okay. So we took that. Now keep in mind back then, if you had money in the bank, believe it or not, you would get 10%. So we're not talking small amounts of money there. We were still $10,000 short of the money on the day of closing. But the Lord had spoken to us. We had a word. We had confidence. We knew God was going to make a way for us where there was no way. I actually was working at a grocery store at the time. I was just 23 years old. Go to work, and I just have confidence something's going to happen. Well, one of the ladies in our group whose husband was not attending with her came and said, my husband was entering into a financial agreement with somebody for $10,000. So he literally uh, froze $10,000 in stocks, borrowed the money, was all ready to use that uh, for this business. It fell through and wanted to know if we could use the money. And I'm like, okay, that's what God had for us. So we had 45000 down for the day of the closing to do that. But keep in mind, we were still borrowing 20000 of the original forty-five. That's why when he said, go borrow vessels, I can relate to this story exactly now this is the way of faith I believed God was going to do it and uh, I had every confidence we we're going to get the building that's why I could have peace the day of the closing but you know I was actually waiting for some big check to come in the mail I'm like how's God going to give us all this money and uh, I didn't know he was going to loan it to us through people <laughs> so I'm like okay that's what we got to do that's what we got to do so we started out borrowing a down payment so we could borrow money to buy a building. And then when we go to get this building, move in, we didn't have enough money to pay utilities or anything. But guess what? We just kept following the Lord. And, and this is one of the things I want to first of all say about the walk of faith. Sometimes you don't know what's going on. And sometimes you just think, well, Lord, this is what you could do to make me comfortable. 
I was a person who, my dad raised us, you know, he had his house paid off in 10 years. Most of my life, my dad did not owe money on his house. Every time he bought something, he paid cash. We were always taught, you don't borrow money. And God's leading me the way of spirit, and it's like, this is totally against my character. This is against everything I do, and God's telling me to do it. And so I'm making this choice to follow him, and I'm kind of like this woman here. Go get some vessels. Borrow as much as you can, and that's exactly what we were doing. But the point I want to emphasize here is how faith works. Faith is, well, it's not going the way you expect because guess what? You're putting your trust in God. It seemed to me like he was just getting me more into debt, but I was making a choice to follow him. Now, this next verse of scripture says, and when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all these vessels and set aside the full ones. Now, why did he tell him to go behind closed doors? Why is it that it's going to be hidden that you don't really quite understand? And, and this is one of the most important points to me. Is you know, I said we went in the debt for the down payment, debt for the building. Well, looking back at the situation, we have such a great testimony. In the process of it happening, it did not seem like a testimony at all. You know when it became a testimony? When a year later we looked back and said, guess what? We paid off the down payment. Guess what? We're paying our bills. Guess what? We're growing. God's adding to the church. The faith walk is kind of like you don't know what's happening until maybe later. So it's kind of like what God's doing is behind these closed doors. All this stuff is happening. And all you're doing is saying, well, I know this much. I'm just going to follow God and I'm going to put my trust in him. And you don't really know what's happening until it has actually happened. And now that I've been pastoring this church now for over 40 years, I can say to you that there's been so many things we've been through. 08, 09, that was a crisis. They said it was worse than anything we had seen since the Great Depression. I studied history, so I know all about this stuff. And so when we come to these points in time and people talk like that, I'm like, I know what that's all about. But guess what? Everything we've ever went through, we've went through. Never knowing quite how, never knowing what God was going to do, but I look back and I say, wow, God, you're so faithful. And so I want to encourage you that you might be facing a situation today. You say, well, I don't know how this could happen. Well, I don't even seem like faith is working because guess what? The big check isn't coming in the mail or it is not just coming together. It seems like I might be getting more in debt or more into the situation that's out of control. And God says, well, what I'm doing oftentimes is behind closed doors because it's a walk of faith. You don't always get to see what's happening until it's actually happening, says the mighty God. And that's why I can be exhilarated at this time as I'm praying in the presence of God. I'm saying like, Lord, wow, this is exciting. What are you going to do? What are you going to show us? Maybe when I just get on the other side, I'm going to look back and say, oh, that's what he did. Sometimes he'll give me an idea along the way and I'll say, this is what we're going to do now. So it's the walk of faith. Faith is when you believe like Father Abraham in the God who calls the things that are not as though they were. God said it. He said, this is your reality that you have to walk in. And so you don't have to turn on CNBC and find out what the stock market is necessarily doing on such your job. And you don't need to always weigh in and say, well, who's in control? I want you to know something. It's not the Republicans or the Democrats in control for your life. In the end, you've got to remember... Your God sits on the throne, you're in the kingdom of God, and you can have this confidence that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He said in that scripture, you shall shut the door behind you, and you and your sons pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. And that's why in, in the walk of faith, you have to always be ready to give whatever you have to give. Now think about that. We were trying to raise $45,000 in the beginning and we were having garage sales. Now think about it. If you're people without a whole lot of money and jobs, what do you have to sell in a garage sale? <laughs> and uh, putting together a bake sale, we didn't own a bakery. So really, when you looked at what we were able to, it was so meager, really. But we still had to do what we could do. And so always remember the walk of faith, it's a walk where you say, well, I don't know that 
I can accomplish this myself, but I'm going to do whatever is necessary to do, believing that as I give what I have to give, God is going to certainly do the rest. And this is so important for us to understand. It goes on to say, So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Now, I, I, I want to talk about the walk of faith in another dimension of this because this is so important to understand. Because she was able to be blessed according to her willingness to be obedient to the word of God. Go borrow some vessels and borrow not a few. In other words, don't limit God by your unwillingness to prepare a place for him to do his awesome work. Because, like I said, you don't always know how it's going to happen till you get to the other side. Today, as I was praying, I was thinking about this with the children of Israel. Remember when God delivered them from the Pharaoh and the slavery of Egypt? How they, by Moses' leading, they were leaving Egypt because finally the Pharaoh had said, now you can go. And all of a sudden, they find out the Pharaoh and his armies are chasing after them. Can you imagine their distress at that point in time? All of these wonderful things happen, and now look, there's an army after us, and in front of us is the Red Sea. The Lord says to Moses, now Moses, I want you to put your rod up in the air. And when he did that, the waters parted for the people. And Moses said, there's a path for you to walk in. Now, they go down into the ocean, and there's on both sides, the Bible says, like watery walls. Now, I have to share a personal aspect of this myself. Uh, since I was a kid reading Bible stories, I always like to visualize them and just kind of put myself into those situations. I love to go on a vacation where I'm next to the ocean. I think the ocean's awesome, and if there's some mountains thrown in, that's even better. But I never like to get in oceans. I love to watch nature shows about what's happening in the natural world. But I don't like the ones that go underwater. Because, well, the creatures down there to me are just not so pleasant to look at. They're actually kind of scary when you think about the jellyfish and the octopus and all these high things going on. So I don't know about you, but if I was walking through the Red Sea and I'm looking at both sides and I'm looking over on this side and seeing some jellyfish, some sharks and all these kind of things, I think, this is scary. They're getting away from one problem and it seems like they're getting into another problem. Did it ever feel like that as you were walking the walk of faith? And then as they're walking through, they happen to notice that the Pharaoh and his armies are coming into the water as well. That wasn't too pleasant of a situation, was it? But what happened is when they got to the other side, that's when the waters came together and destroyed the power of of the enemy now this is so important to understand because when did they have a testimony that they could share well it wasn't when they were over here worried about the Pharaoh and his armies it was almost a testimony when the waters opened up but then they get in there and find out well this is a scary situation they didn't really have their testimony until they were all the way over to the other side and that's why God says, you got to keep on getting those vessels ready. You need to have those vessels prepared, not a few. You got to keep operating in faith, not just walking through the situation, but having this confidence that, well, since there is a testimony on the other side, you don't want to limit God. You want to be prepared for whatever blessing he has for you. The children of Israel were going to the promised land. Where was this, where's the Pharaoh and his people going? Well, they were going to the bottom of the Red Sea. God says to his people, we need to have a confidence at all times that God has a destiny for us, and we want to be totally prepared for that destiny. That woman didn't even understand that as she got all these vessels together and was pouring oil in them, exactly what it is that God was going to do. But because she did not prepare more vessels, all of the oil ceased. Think about this story. If she would have kept 
on getting the vessels, she would have kept on getting the oil. See, I've been following the Lord now, like I said, over 40 years of ministry. And you know, it's just as exciting now as it ever was. Now, it actually has to be more exciting because I want you to know something. When you're 24, there's a natural energy and excitement you have about life. When you get 42 years later, you kind of need a little extra more Holy Ghost, if you would, in order to really stir you up. It, it takes a lot more. Actually, even though you have the wisdom to see what God's done, you need more of that power and that energy from the Holy Spirit. And guess what? God's been giving it to me. I just have such a sense that God's going to do something awesome in this day. And that's why I want to encourage every single one of you. Prepare your vessels, not a few. Don't let the oil cease because you stopped keep the oil flowing a lot of times when people walk in the spirit filled walk they kind of come to a stop and they find a comfortable place and they just kind of sit down and relax and God said no don't sit still keep on moving forward because the more you prepare room for the anointing oil you're going to get it says the mighty God and I tell you this is a day when there's a new anointing that's just being poured out upon the church and God's saying we need each and every one of us to just open our heart in a greater measure and this is where this next verse of scripture comes from in Matthew chapter 25 it says but his Lord answered and said to him you wicked and lazy servant you knew what I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Now I want you to understand that from this perspective, if you're looking at this uh, from political or economic persuasions, you'd have to be fully aware of the fact that the Lord's a capitalist in this sense. He doesn't say, well, take from the person who has and gives to him who has not. He says that person over here has more because they're willing to work more. They're willing to invest more. They're willing to give themselves. The walk of faith is a daring walk. It's a walk where you're challenging your faith, but also so there's really a, a natural side to this and it's something simple is give God all the energy that you possibly can because when you give him all your energy he's going to add more energy give him more give him more the more you give to him the more he's going to give to you the more that you offer to him the more that's going to be poured back says the mighty God and this is such an important thing in this particular story as he's talking about this person who was fearful in the parable of the talents there was one who had five talents he multiplied it one who had two talents he multiplied it this one talented person just thought well I just don't have that much and so I'm gonna hide it and, and you know what he did he even blamed the master when he came to him and he said well I know what you're like he said well if you just would have put that money in the bank if you just would have put it somewhere God's saying to you today what do you have to give put it somewhere put it somewhere it can work whatever faith you have whatever energy you have there's somebody watching this program right now and you just feel so drained inside you're like so frazzled that you think you have nothing to give but I want you to know something your God says to you I'm more than enough and I have more than enough of a supply says the mighty God and if you will be willing to give of yourself if you will put in your part I'll put in mine that's why I love to think about the old stories when we had just a small group of people who had so little to give. But you know what? They put it all in. And when they were willing to put it all in, that's why all these years later we have multi-million dollar ministries of buildings and opportunities to minister to so many people. And God is saying, whatever you have, put it in. Because you're going to see with God that he's always faithful every time. Having said that in verse 7 it says and she came and told the man of God and he said go sell the oil and pay your debt you and your sons live on the rest. Isn't that an amazing story? In, in the close of the story I want to say something interesting though. 
<laughs> because I, I, I see this story and I see how she's had this miracle. She gathers all of these vessels and what happens? She pours oil. She pours oil. Her house is so filled with oil, she's all excited about the oil and she runs and tells the man of God. And know what he tells her to do? Now go and sell it. Now, you might read that story and you might think, well, that's easy enough. Look at all that she has to sell. Well, I don't know about you, but I've never been a salesman. I've never been a person that thought I could go out and sell. And I want you to know this widow woman with her two sons, I'm sure she wasn't a salesman either. So when the man of God said, now go sell it, there might have been resistance in her who said, I can't do that. You see, as I've walked the walk of faith, just like I mentioned about the money, which was so different than how I would have planned this out. Now, I know some people love borrowing money, not even thinking about the future, but that's not who I was. I found out as I walked the walk of faith, God has always put me in situations that were above me and always is asking me things to do that I didn't necessarily feel comfortable doing. So what is it that God's asking you to do and you're uncomfortable in your discomfort zone, God is able to manifest his glory. Now, because God is my father, you know what I found out? Sometimes I actually was well suited for the task he gave me. I just didn't know it. But as a father, he just began to lift me up and bring me this place. And he would teach me. And I, I began to find out who I really was. Some of you listen to this program today, you don't even know who you are, but your Heavenly Father does. He knows what you can handle. He knows what you can do. And He wants you to become the fullest that you've ever been before. Or maybe it's just this step into the unknown, which is the walk of faith. I tell you, God has something so awesome that He wants to do in each and every one of our lives. How is it that you're being stretched today? I want you to know what your God can do for you. I want you to know he's going to do something that's exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ask or think. That's the scripture that's been coming to me so strongly in recent months, literally. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it been in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Don't you love him? Reach out to him now.